This is Sarah Stewart Holland. This is Beth Silvers. You're listening to Pantsu Politics, where we take a different approach to the news. Beth, thank you so much for joining us for a new episode of Pantsuit Politics. We're thrilled that you're here. We hope that you enjoyed the Memorial Day holiday. That holiday is why we're in your feed on Wednesday instead of our normal Tuesday-Friday rhythm. It's really important to us to give everyone who works behind the scenes on our show an opportunity to rest and reflect and be with people they love. And we hope that you had that opportunity over the weekend as well. We're really excited today to be joined by Elizabeth Holmes of So Many Thoughts. Sarah sat down with Elizabeth, who is a journalist and commentator on royal and political fashion. Elizabeth provides commentary about the power of fashion choices when you dress for the world stage. You're going to hear Sarah and Elizabeth talk about everyone from Queen Elizabeth to Michelle Obama to Second Gentleman Doug Imhoff to Travis Kelsey. And coincidentally, they will discuss Nikki Haley's fashion choices. This conversation was recorded when Nikki Haley was still a candidate in the Republican nominating contest. Of course, at the end of last week, Nikki Haley announced that she will support Donald Trump for president. And I think their discussion of her wardrobe through and including that Hudson Institute event really holds up. I am personally still processing her announcement. I let out some visceral reactions on Friday's episode of More to Say, one of our premium shows. I'm certain Sarah and I will continue to discuss it. But it is very interesting to listen to Sarah and Elizabeth talk about her choices and how she presents herself in light of this new information. Before we share that conversation, don't forget that tomorrow, this Thursday night, is our virtual event, The Nuanced Life Live. Even if you can't join us live, if you buy a ticket in advance, you'll be able to get the recording of the event. We've planned some very special conversation. Lots of good questions have come in from all of you about work-life balance. That's what we're going to be talking about because this event is really the kickoff of our summer, the Nuanced Life series that we've been telling you about for the past couple of weeks. So we would love to see you live and online tomorrow night at the Nuanced Life Live. All the information that you'll need to get tickets is in the show notes, and we are very, very excited about everything we have planned for you over the summer. Up next, Sarah's conversation with Elizabeth Holmes of So Many Thoughts. Elizabeth, welcome to Fancy Politics. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I am the most excited of the two of us. Listen, I promise you I am. I have been following your work for so many years, now you're on Substack at So Many Thoughts. You started on Instagram. How how did this become your beat? Tell the people what your beat is if they're not as huge a fan as I am and how you got started. So I was a Wall Street Journal reporter for 10 years, and I left that job in 2017, and I moved from New York to California, and I had my second kid, and I was like, hanging out in California. I was freelancing and I was trying to figure out who I was because let me tell you, when you spend a decade at the Wall Street Journal, that becomes your whole professional identity. Mm. And I'm so grateful for the time that I had there and I adore my colleagues and very much respect all the journalism that comes out of that newspaper. But it was definitely time for a change. And I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to do next? And so I was freelancing. I'm, I'm freelancing for all different kinds of places. But what I was really interested in was fashion. And it's because at the Wall Street Journal, I covered a lot of different things, including politics a lifetime ago, but I was a style reporter. And so my eye always goes to what people are wearing and not just what they're wearing, but what message it sends. Because at the Wall Street Journal, I covered the business of fashion. So it's not just about beautiful clothes, which they are very beautiful, but it's about the marketing and the branding and the, you know, the power of fashion and what fashion can say. And my mind went immediately to the royals, who I followed for a very long time, the British royal family. And I have um, got sucked in in 2011 when Will and Kate got married. And they, those women used their fashion so intentionally because they are photographed. Those pictures go around the world in seconds before we know what cause they're supporting, what event they're attending. We see what they're wearing, and they know that, and they use it. They craft a visual brand. They promote their work through their, like, they'll wear the color of the charity they're attending or something like that. They're, they're very smart in their choices to send a message. And so back in 2017, when I was hanging out in California, <laughs> nursing my second son in the middle of the night, 
I saw a picture of Will and Kate on Instagram and I thought, I have so many thoughts about this. And I screenshotted it and I added a bunch of little text bubbles and I posted it. And what I had not realized was that there was this very smart and strong community of women and some men too on the internet that wanted to talk about this stuff too, that wanted to talk about what fashion can say. Mm -hmm. And so I used all my background as a Wall Street Journal reporter and talking to these companies and understanding these brands and sort of used it to decode clothing choices. And it was very much about the Royals for a long time. And I've since tried to expand a little bit because there's so much good fashion out there and there's so much that speaks to me. And I just, I, I you know, I, I love it. <laughs> I love looking at what someone's wearing and trying to take it to the next step, not just like, oh, how does it look? But what does it mean? Yeah. When you expanded into American politics, I was like, my time has come. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. I mean, listen, I love the Royals. Love. I was in that community where I'm like, thank you, because you brought a seriousness to it, which I very much appreciated. Because it is serious. It's very serious. And that's the thing. And people are like, why do you care so much of what they wear? I care because they care, because mm -hmm. they spend a lot of time. And in the case of the late Queen Elizabeth, she had a team of like 10 people whose jobs it were to get her dressed, yep. right? And she did it so intentionally and so methodically and so error-free for yes. 70 years. It's, you know, people are so quick to dismiss fashion as this frivolous, fun thing. No, it is hard and it is work and it is important. Yep. And so starting with the Royals made a lot of sense for me and now I'm really having fun expanding into all different kinds of fashion. Well, you know, we did a show on dress codes with our oldest children, like maybe last year or the year before. And we were trying to kind of work through, why does this matter? What what bothers us about it? And we had a listener write in and say, clothing communicates. And I thought, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the little, that's the sentence I needed whenever I have these conversations, that it communicates. And if you're a public figure who, oh, I don't know, doesn't do a lot of interviews, doesn't talk a lot to express how you feel when you're representing an institution— then, of course, it's communicating. Like you said, the pictures speak before anything else, and they are speaking. So you took it seriously. What surprised you the more you did this so many thoughts? Like, what did you learn from this sort of diving in depth that you didn't already realize from your time at the Wall Street Journal? I think it's how much work it takes and how, I mean, if you ever try and do this yourself, <laughs> 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 You'll learn that it's not, you know, you're not just picking out an outfit that looks nice. You're trying to pick an outfit that means something, too, or that ties into an event or sends a message in some way. And that's before you get who made the outfit. Exactly. That's not even talking about, like, who actually made the coat. We're not even that part yet. Or getting the thing tailored or making sure your pantyhose don't have runs in them. You know, I mean, like, all of that. It's just a tremendous amount of work. Yep. There needs to be a broader conversation about the burden of presentation placed on women, right? Because it's disproportionate. There's mm -hmm. so much more attention placed on women's clothes. But it's also an opportunity. And I think some of the savviest women in power on the global stage right now, they embrace that, right? They take that as a moment and they use it to their advantage. And I really respect that. And so when I try and decode or dissect their choices, it's a way of sort of honoring the effort mm -hmm. because it's a lot of work. Oh, it's so much work. I remember reading Tom and Lorenzo's Mad Men oh, yes. write-ups. And I thought, oh, I, I love this stuff. And I had no idea. Just like the color theory or how they would you know, do like the roses died as the relationship died, like just the level of things you can subconsciously communicate to people through these layers of clothing choices is available to everyone, storytellers, royalty, mm -hmm. politicians, like, and even us in our own lives, even when we think we're not communicating with these choices, we are communicating to a certain extent. Yes, costume designers are are so good at this. And oh my so when gosh. you're watching your favorite TV show, you can kind of clue into it. And the more you look for it, the more you'll see. Yep. But a major unlock for me, do you remember their show Girls? Yes. The show Girls that was on, you know, um, a while back. But I remember reading an interview with the costume designer and she's like, the clothes are not supposed to fit. Yes, because they're young. Like they purposely made them not fit because of course, when you're in that stage in your life, your clothes don't fit and you look a little off. So and that good. all like served the purpose because if they had been in these polished outfits, Fits, like it wouldn't have made any sense. So yes, it's all done intentionally. I love it. Or like with the Mad Men when they, I got to where I would say like, oh, these people are going to fight because she would put them in conflicting colors, oh, yes. like clashing color. I'm like, oh, we got some conflict coming up because yep. I, I like, yeah. started to decode it before <laughs> it happened. And I think that is so interesting. So as you 
you know, you're in this this royal scene, which is very different. It is it is the if, if there is a hierarchy of this like precision, I would say even higher than like you know fashion figures in the industry, like the precision at which they are exercising yes. these choices is like this is the this is the top of the game. Then you cut. Then you start expanding into American politics. And what do you think is the I mean, there are many differences, but what it what did you notice immediately as far as like the difference between the the royals and way they use their clothing to communicate and and somebody like Vice President Harris or First Lady Biden? I think the thing that they share is a set of really difficult expectations, Mm. right? Because they are supposed to be human. They are supposed to be relatable to a certain extent, right? In terms of voters, right? You want to woo voters and there's this every person idea. You know, you don't want to look lofty or above, but you want to be worthy of the position that you hold. And so with the royal family, they're walking this line of trying to be like this accessible royal family, but then also these aspirational figures worthy of living in palaces. And I think there's an element of that Mm -hmm. in politics here in the U.S. The big difference, though, is that American politicians speak all the time. That's their job, right? We need to hear from them. (laughs) They never stop, Elizabeth. Never stop. And royal women don't, really. I mean, that is changing, and that certainly has been much different in the past couple of years with Harry and Meghan. But in the past, you just saw them, right? And so their clothing takes on this very important role, especially like back in Princess Diana's time. Like she saw this, she knew she wasn't, I mean, she did give a couple of great interviews, but for the most part, she was just seen. And so she was crafting her image so carefully and trying to use the clothes to speak for her and, and and work through this really complicated system that she was trapped in. And so I think here in America, especially when it comes to politicians, you have to consider what they say first and then how, how what they wear, how that fits into it, how that supports it, or sometimes in some cases sort of goes at odds with it. And if you think about Vice President Harris on the campaign trail, she had a couple signature pieces, right? Her pearls. She got to be known for her pearls or her converse. Yeah. And then on Inauguration Day, people turned up in their pearls or their converse. And so it's this opportunity, too, for all of us that are watching along to sort of support this person in a way that represents them. It's the same with RBG and her statement, mm-hmm. you know, or, uh, callers. It's like this, this visual legacy that people are crafting, and then it allows everyone else to participate in it, too, which I think is really Really special. Well, and I think it's so interesting to watch their journeys. You know, people who have been in the public eye for a long time. I particularly think with Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama, you can see this sort of journey they took, especially when they hit a spot where you're just like, oh, you're free now. You feel free to mm-hmm. You know, like I tell the story all the time that when I worked for Hillary Clinton's campaign, I was in this meeting with a bunch of sort of second wave old guard feminists from like NARAL and Planned Parenthood. And I said as a young intern, I relate the most to her when she talks about her hair or her clothes and like struggling with that. And they lit into me. She should not talk about that. That is not serious. And you could see her fight that, like I think over the Mm. course of her career. And then she hit this spot, I think particularly in 2016, where she was like, no, I love this and it matters to me. And you could see her kind of find her footing and what she was choosing to wear and and letting it be a statement, letting people talk about it, talking about it herself. And I think the same, I think about Michelle Obama coming out in those pants on Inauguration Day, just like, I'm going to do what I want. Because she was really good, I think, at elevating designers and being very focused on who made the clothes. Are we representing a wide range of places, a wide range of identities? Like, she was so good at that. But she, it did seem like she she clicked into place where it was it was that and what she loved and how she wanted to look and how she felt the most empowered and embodied is how it felt to me. So I think Hillary definitely, if you look back, you know, so much of American political fashion for women, for female candidates has been about the dark suit, right? Yes. They're kind of blend in with the guys like, don't, like, I'm not a woman, what? I'm, yes. just, I'm, I'm not here with the boys, you know, like, <laughs> we're just all the same. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. And then by 2016, Hillary did embrace fashion and she worked with Anna Wintour and she looked fabulous. She you know, she it. there was color all of a sudden on the campaign trail and there was something to talk about. And that was so exciting to me because I do desperately want fashion and power to go together in a way that is celebrated and not uh, not open someone up for criticism because so often it's like again like I said it's like oh it's frivolous or it's fun it's like no it's important and it's an opportunity and then with Michelle Obama you know her fashion I think about her 
before she was on the campaign trail with her husband and then in the White House and now certainly after. Oh, after. Oh, my God. I mean, because I feel like once she got in the White House, she was, you know, very aware, as you said, of the designers she wore, the price points. That was also new. Yeah, high-low. She did a lot of high-low. Yes, that was so important. And because suddenly there are fashion blogs that can document everything she's wearing and serve up a link. And that's the same with royal fashion, too. And there is such economic power in that, right? Because people see those choices, then they run to buy it. And then if you carry it one step further, like if you've ever bought anything that anybody famous has ever worn, like I bought a pair of the first, (laughs) I bought a pair of J. Crew boots that Meghan Markle wore and I put them on and they were my Meghan boots and let me tell you they felt different it was fun you know it's just this moment and so Michelle I think was so smart to dress as she did for those eight years but now my god I love love because she is totally free now she is free she is. She looks fabulous. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Head to toe in her book tour that went on and on and on. And the looks that just kept coming. And I was just like, yes, this is who you are. Yeah. And this is someone who <laughs> loves fashion. I'm going to wear what I want. I want when people exactly. would be like, are you going to run for president? I'm like, can you? If you were paying attention to her close, you would know this. You would know the answer to that question already. Hell yeah. no is the answer. Look at her. She just is look at her. not interested. She is telling no, you she is free. already. She is free. <laughs> and it's yes. same with Hillary. Like, I even see her clothes change post the election, like, I, you see that she, like, there's a lot more comfort. Like, she's not killing herself. Like, you could tell, like, she has a lot more comfort, a lot more pattern, a lot more color. Because her favorite color is yellow, for Christ's sake. Like, of course she wants to be, she doesn't want to be in a dark suit all the time. When I was working for her way back in 2007, she had this, like, canary yellow suit. I have a picture with oh. her in. Oh. She loves yellow. Oh, I love that. Yes. And it's like, you can just see that she's, she wears what she wants now. Mm-hmm. And I get, that's got to be such a piece of this. Because I think that's the thing. I think people get caught up in when you talk about fashion, they think it means you're always dressing for someone else. Yes, I think there's a difference between personal style, which is very important, and then how you dress for public consumption. And the people who can put those together, that's a powerful weapon to me. Oh, that is. And it is very hard. And so when we see like, you know, it's rare, but every now and then you'll see like a a grainy photo of Kate you know, with the kids or something. And I never weigh in on that because that is just her personal style. And that is her moment where she is doing her mom thing. I think it's very different when you get dressed because you know you are stepping out in front of cameras and people will see you and those pictures will go everywhere. And that is hard. It's yes. just hard and it takes time and it takes resources, it takes money. It's just, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And it takes staff. I mean, I don't think people yes. understand like, the level of work. And it is, and it, I think you're right. It's it's unfair that there is a increased expectation with women. I'd love to hear what you have to say about our uh, second gentleman and, and his fashion choices. Um, <laughs> because he's he's somebody that's like not giving a lot of interviews. He's not wielding policy power to a certain extent, but he has ma- he's got to make those same choices when he steps out. But I mean, the staff to like find the, the designer, schedule it, get the tailoring or figure the high-low option, make sure you're not doing something that is going to be out of stock if you really do want it to be accessible. All those pieces, like there, there's just so many moving parts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who you're wearing and if that designer has been embroiled in any controversies oh, lately or if they made any statements or, you know, it's it's a lot of work. And so that's why I'm always like we need to honor the effort behind it because it takes so much time. And I think if you look, uh, the second gentleman, so dear. <laughs> so dear. You want to give him a hug? You want to be like, I'm no, just I, saying I, I did. I was at the White House la- in, uh, for the Easter egg roll and I was with my kids and I was like, guys, come here. I was like, it's the second <laughs> Anyway, so sweet. But, like, nobody's expecting him mm. to look pretty. No. You know, that's hard, too. And so I just feel like there is there is this double standard. And as much as I want to celebrate fashion, I also just always want to acknowledge the work it takes. I do think that there we are seeing more spaces where men are putting in the work. I think that on red carpets, you are seeing... Much, yes. much more expansive, expansive choices. I think these NFL looks and the fits. Yep. I'm here for the NFL fits. I think it's very exciting. They've turned that little walk into the stadium into a runway. They have. And brands have noticed and now they're, they're doing deals. So what do you think about that? Do you feel like that change is coming? 
Well, so it definitely started on the red carpet and we started seeing, you know, men embrace more than just a black or a navy tux. At first it was like a navy tux. It was like, like, oh my God. So exciting. Yeah, exactly. And now, you know, now it's trickling down from the red carpet where they are taking more risks. We're getting, you know, these are traditionally, I hate this, but quote unquote macho guys, like football Mm -hmm. players embracing like Travis and his sequins at the Super Bowl, you know, that... That can be easy to dismiss as like an attention move, but I think the actual, if you think about it, the ripple effect is pretty profound because it's all the people that are watching. And I think I have two boys and I think about them watching this professional football player in sequins and my kids love playing dress up and they love colors and they love, and I'm like, I hope. I hope that this is seeping into you to in some capacity. Now, whether that will actually ever translate into men in politics, I don't know. Do you remember when President Obama wore that tan suit and everybody lost their minds? Everybody lost it. I was like, come on. Guys, stop it. <laughs> guys, I think it will. I think you get younger. There was that really fascinating piece on younger politicians and the, the clothing choices they were making. Did you read that? I did. I thought that was so interesting. So I think you're already seeing that, that they acknowledge, like, I I thought the most interesting part is, like, nobody wants to match. Like, they don't want to wear a suit at all. No. Well, and also, we live in a hyper-visual time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just cable news. It's Instagram. It's TikTok. Like, you are what you present to the world now. It's not just a photograph on the cover of a newspaper, right? You're on people's screens. And if you can't catch their attention with your words, then maybe use your clothes. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I think the other aspect of this is, you know, what I think is so interesting in that space. And I think you're, you you saw it a little bit in that article about the the younger politicians, which tells me it's prolific around, among younger generations. And that means it will it will spread. It will infect the celebrities. It will infect the politicians, which is they are way, way more aware and consumed and educated about like where the clothing comes from. Is it brand new? Is it fast fashion? Is it thrifted? And the quality of the clothing. I feel like there is an increased conversation, which is why I always like the royal family because they they might be recommending you buy stuff, but you best believe that it is high quality. Like the, the I bought one of those sweat when Kate wore the pink Feral sweater, the Campbell sweater. I buy those now. They're such, they're such good quality. And I think like that, that to me is a really interesting place that it's almost like there's a symbiotic relationship between the consumer and these public figures that are having this conversation about like what what not only how does it look but how is it made well and how many times can you wear it right right because that's so important because we were i mean I'm guilty of this when I was in my 20s you know you buy something at H&M and throw it out kind of thing i mean i didn't throw it out but you know you don't wear it that often and so to see somebody like Kate or Megan pull from their closet something that fashion bloggers have documented they wore many times you know it sounds so silly. I had to sit down the first time that happened. I grew up in the <laughs> 90s. That did not happen. Never, it never. It did not happen. And so, but it reminds you that these are real people with real closets and they have clothes that they love. And yes, you should wear them many yeah. times. Well, like I even, I remember reading that Jackie did that when she was in the White House. I mean, she'd worn that pink suit from the assassination of like John's birthday party a few days earlier. I remember reading that. Princess Diana was like a famous repeater, but because the internet didn't exist back then, nobody was chronicling it. So it didn't, it it didn't like, it didn't hit in the same way. And then suddenly, you know, we're all, again, in this hypervisual age, we're all shopping for occasions and to, you know, put up our album on Facebook or whatever (laughs) in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then suddenly, you know, You can't wear something more than once. But I think that this kind of documentation of fashion, suddenly it's come back around. The pendulum is swung where it's like, okay, no, Kate has worn this coat four times or six times or whatever. It's a favorite of hers. And then suddenly that helps the brand, right, that she's wearing because suddenly it's worthy of all these times. And then it just reminds you to be like a responsible consumer. Right. Okay, well, you're not the only one, since you brought up Megan, you're not the only one who who was an American, had some interest in the royal family, and then came back and has straddled (laughs) both of these spaces. (laughs) What do you see in her choices? I mean, and I think at this point, her she is speaking more than other members of the royal family, obviously. She has taken control of her narrative way more than other members. What do you see in her choices from the beginning that you're like, the signs were always there and, and more recently? Well, the thing about Megan, so I wrote a book. HRH. I love it. It's on my shelf. It's about <laughs> the Queen's fashion, Diana's fashion, Kate, and then Megan's fashion. And there's a section on each of them. 
And the thing that sets Megan apart from that group is that she came to the royal family into this immense spotlight, knowing the language of fashion. She had been on mm-hmm. television. She had worked with costume designers. She knew there's it's that it's out there. She gave interviews about the importance of colors and fit and choices of her character's clothing. So she knew what clothing could say. And so you saw her sort of hit the ground running with this very it wasn't all that different from like how regular women dress, but it was very different for the royal yes. conversation. She did things like wear trousers to daytime engagements, which sounds absurd because, of course, every woman everywhere wears pants all the time. And yet, we hadn't seen it. And so it felt new and novel. And it was it was groundbreaking in a lot of ways. And you saw her, though, as her royal tenure went on, also try and you know, match her personal style with the like expectations of the mm-hmm. royal family and the and the public and the criticism of the media, which was it just got totally out of control. And now, what I think we're seeing from her, it was interesting after you know 2020 when they stepped down as senior working royals, we didn't see a lot of them. And then when we did see her, she was in some very high fashion stuff. Which listen, she knows fashion. She has relationships with brands. I I think she truly loves fashion. But now we've sort of seen this, again, the pendulum kind of finding its middle point with the Invictus Games last year. She was back to wearing, you know, Banana Republic or J. Crew, And you better believe I bought that (laughs) every cardigan that she was wearing. I had had to cart so fast. She's like, I'm going to buy this for myself before I tell y'all about it. I better believe that. (laughs) I did. I did. I bought it before I shared it. But so I feel like she's finding her place. The criticism that can come from one's appearance, and especially Megan being, you know, um, a biracial woman in an overwhelmingly white uh, royal world, was just, it was awful. I mean, her appearance was used against her in the worst ways and driven by a racist tabloid media in Britain that, like, I don't think we as Americans can fully understand because we don't have that same I mean, we have awful media here, don't get me wrong. (laughs) But I think I'm so happy because when I see Megan now and her appearances, I see her. I see so much of her in them and the fact that she's able to, like you said, mix personal style and, and, and public outings in such a way that feels very authentic. That's when fashion is best, right? Not when you're trying to wear a costume or play a part, but when you're you. Mm Mm-hmm with thought and intention behind your choices. Yeah, you know it when you see it, even if you don't care about fashion. Exactly. You know when, when somebody is doing it, you're like, oh, okay. Well, and that's my thing. So when I moved from New York to California, I moved to Silicon Valley, and suddenly I was, like, surrounded by hoodies. And all these people were like, it doesn't matter fashion. I was like, you made a choice with that hoodie. That's a choice. <laughs> Everybody gets dressed every day. Everybody's doing it. I don't care what it is. If everybody's doing it, something's happening. Yes, and you're doing it for a reason, and you can claim it's comfort or whatever, but listen, you're doing it for a reason, and it's to look laid back, and it's to fit in with the crowd, and it's to be part of the tech store, and then I moved down to Los Angeles, and suddenly everybody's a different vibe, and I was like, this is so fascinating, because we all sort of play, and then I go back and visit D.C., and I'm like, everybody's back in suits and ties, and it's it's more formal, and and we all all make the choice to get dressed every morning. Nobody's running around naked. Nope, and the clothing... (laughs) communicates. It does. It sure does. So what do you think is the most interesting story, either in fashion generally or the royal family right now? What are you really paying close attention to? Well, I was hoping to talk quickly about Nikki Haley because I think she has a very interesting approach on the campaign trail. And I wrote um, a newsletter on my Substack about her recently because we've seen so few viable female presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. And doing so with a traditionally, I'm going to put in quotes, feminine aesthetic is really noteworthy to me. Yeah. And, you know, she's wearing, she's out there on the debate stage wearing a skirt yep. or a dress. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> like that should not be news. But again. There are no dark suits for her. Mm-mm. No, no. And it makes her, if it's like, if you're looking for someone who's not Trump, you can, your eye goes right to her yeah. right? <laughs> because she's right there. And she's wearing pearls. She's wearing soft colors. She's wearing these very like traditional silhouettes and she's not leaning away from color or interesting fabrics and things like that. And part of that makes my heart sing because I'm like, yes, I want to see more women wear clothes that they like when they're reaching for the highest office in the land kind of thing. But it also, it creates this tension between her policies, right? Because she's got these very harsh and anti-everything stances and suddenly she's delivering it in a dress. And so you as a viewer... 
it's this weird, you know, I'm I, suddenly I'm thinking about, you know, the trad wife trend <laughs> on TikTok. And you're like, wait, are you, is this a throwback? Are you, uh, are you, are you pushing the needle forward? Or are we going back a couple steps? So it's, it's been a very interesting thing to watch her on the campaign trail. And then, you know, in this last dash with the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary, she started wearing sweaters. Yeah. Which again, not a big deal. I'm wearing a sweater right now. Yeah. But you're like, oh, when have I seen a, a woman on the campaign trail wear a statement sweater? And what does that mean? And it's like soft and cozy and approachable. And you know what? That's what voters in Iowa are wearing. That's what voters in New Hampshire are wearing. And so it takes on this, these choices take on these meanings that are just this fascinating play between what they're saying and what they're wearing and how voters then write it in their head to be like, do I like her or not? Yeah. Like what's going on? And I hope we see more women experiment with fashion and power and, and across the entire political spectrum because there's there's a lot there and there's a lot of progress that still needs to be made. I wonder a lot with her is I think she's dressing for herself. I think she's definitely dressing for the voters, knowing that she's going to be looked at and perceived. But I also think she's dressing for Donald Trump. He comments on it. Yeah, exactly. Lest you forget that I'm a woman, which upsets you. Um, Mm -hmm. Let me make sure and wear these dresses and these skirts. And like, there's a part of me that thinks like she's poking just a little bit at him. Well, what did he say on New Hampshire? It wasn't a very nice dress. I don't think the fancy dress is probably not that fancy. Yeah, like not that expensive. It's not that expensive. And I looked into it, and it's it it's he he's right. <laughs> it was a nice so she has this she tends to wear this label called Terry John. Okay. And it's got this very Oscar de la Renta aesthetic. It's very kind of mother of the bride. Yes. You know, it's colorful, but it's nice to fabric. Applique. Yes, like a full skirt, yes, some jacquard, you know, like a very it's very ladylike. Yeah. And it's this Oscar aesthetic. But it's like, you know, and it's not cheap, you know, yeah. it's several hundred dollars for a dress, but it's not like several thousand dollars for a dress. And so she's walking this line, right? Because she's playing this part. But if anyone's really going to look into it, she's not going to look like she's just spending money on clothes right and left. So it feels kind of responsible. It's this weird, it's this very interesting mix that she's walking and she's worn this, this brand Terry John for a long time. And I think that's part of her image. You know, it's just like this, like I'm presenting like a lady who lunches, Mm -hmm. but it's at a more accessible price point. And I'm a lady and it's just, (laughs) I'm fascinated. And the fact that Trump comments on it, like he's taking the bait and she's offering it. It's just. Oh, so easy. He's such a chump. I mean, I think that he, (laughs) I think the in-between price point too is a very important point when you're talking about female politicians, because these are not people who are getting sent clothes for free. And even if they were, they could not accept them because that would be a donation. I think that that's like what's really hard to understand. You know, it's one thing if you're the royal family and you have a lot of resources and a lot of staff, but when you're a female politician and you have to decide, like it's one, again, if you're Hillary Clinton, you've got the money to, to figure out and do the suits and the white suits and Anna Wintour's help, that's great. But Nikki Haley is not independently wealthy. You know, like she just no. isn't. Her husband is deployed. Like, I think that that's the other really difficult part is just the expense. Uh, and you can't, t- if even if you found a brand you loved and you thought we would be a great partnership, you can't partner with them as a fee. Like, that's not. <laughs> That's not allowed. Well, and also, so I, in 2008, I covered the presidential campaign, which was like a lifetime ago. And I was on the trail with John McCain and then Sarah Palin. And if you remember, that was, again, a lifetime ago. People made a huge fuss over the makeover that she went through and mm-hmm. the Neiman Marcus of it all. And they were trying to tally up her clothes and things like that. And the, you're exactly right. The the logistics and the expenses of fashion cannot be overstated. And also hauling all these clothes around on the campaign trail when they're in a suitcase, you need someone to steam that dress. <laughs> you need someone to, I mean, it's it's a lot. And I think that the, when was it? It was a, a couple cycles ago, suddenly it came out that a bunch of members of Congress were doing Rent the Runway. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? And I was like, of course, like you should, right? Because like they, that's a, like a, a more financially responsible or accessible way to wear different clothes. News broadcasters and politicians, that's perfect for them. Yep. Wear those bright color dresses and then send it back and get something new. It's really, the, the challenge is immense. Well, I'm so glad you said Ladies to Lunch because the fashion I'm obsessed with right now is the Swans, Ryan Murphy's new show. Oh, Are you watching? So good. It's, it's, it's on my list. It's on so my good. list. I'm so behind on my TV. Oh, my God. It's so beautiful. I mean, you can watch it on mute, but I love the the role fashion plays. They just did the black and white ball last night. Oh. And so you got to see them come in with their, like, covers and rip them off and their masquerade balls. But it's, you know, the the ladies who lunch style and how they, the different characters are sort of using those choices highly recommend 
That's so good. Well, so there's a show coming up. My friend um, Amy Chozik has a show called Girls on the Bus, which is about female reporters. Oh, fun. It's based on it. She wrote, covered Hillary for many years, and then she wrote a memoir, and then now has spun off a chapter of that into, like, made a TV oh, show. Oh, that's so a fun. fictional TV show. And I was watching it for the campaign trail style because it's so, it comes out in March, but it's so interesting to think about the, the ways in which you can define a character based on what they wear. And essentially, you know, I would imagine in the swans too. It's like, they're all kind of the same, but they're all very different. Very different. Their money comes from different places. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the ways in which people use the costume designers very cleverly sort of craft that. It's just, it's an art. It's an art. Styling is is an art. I love it. And thank you for giving it the seriousness that it deserves. That's why I'm such a big fan of yours. And we love that you come here on Pants and Politics. Oh, it's so serious and I and 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 fun and fun. It can be That's both. why I love it, it so can much. Be both. It's <laughs> both things, guys. It's both things at the same time. Two things can be true. That's, I believe that so deeply. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Sarah and Elizabeth for that discussion. We will be back in your ears on Friday for our last regular Friday episode before we begin our limited run return of The Nuanced Life. And there is plenty to talk about this week in the realm of politics. Join us tomorrow night, Thursday, May 30th, for our kickoff event, The Nuanced Life Live, or grab a ticket today so you can watch it back later at your convenience. Until Friday, have the best week available to you. Pantsu Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our Managing Director. Maggie Pinton is our Director of Community Engagement. Xander Singh is the composer of our theme music with inspiration from original work by Dante Lima. Our show is listener-supported. Special thanks to our executive producers. Martha Brunitsky. Allie Edwards. Janice Elliott. Sarah Greenup. Julie Haller. Tiffany Hassler. Emily Holliday. Katie Johnson. Katina Zuganellis Kasling. Barry Kaufman. Katherine Vollmer. Lori Ladau. Lily McClure. Linda Daniel. The Hutchins! Tracy Putoff. Sarah Ralph. Jeremy Sequoia. Katie Steigers. Karen True. Annika Uveline. Nick and Elisa Vallelli. Amy Whited. Lee Shea McDonough. Morgan McHugh. Jen Ross. Sabrina Drigo. Becca Dorval. Christina Quartararo. Shannon Frawley. Jessica Whitehead. Samantha Chalmers. Crystal Kemp. Megan Hart. The Lima Family! The Adair Family. Jenny Francis. Leanna Pilgrim Larson. The Monene Family. Jeff Davis, Melinda Johnston, Michelle Wood, Nicole Berkless, Paula Bremer, and Tim Miller.